Slippy going. Are you managing the slippy stuff? Yeah, I manage the day to day stuff. So we're doing okay. We're finally spending some money. We hired a contractor to help us with some, all the deliverables that we're doing next week. <laughs> so, did you get this? Oh, this is good. Yeah, yeah. And then actually, John, uh, we hired his contractor to help us with all that stuff. So, we'll likely turn this position to the FTE with the contractor. Uh, that will spend a lot of it. No, just bugging along and trying to get people to understand why giving us information. I they just don't get it yet because there's no networks. So how does that inform? It's really hard to make yeah. that connection. Yeah. They give us this data now. Two, three years. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. an interesting predicament that we're at. And we're finding you know, our average response across we pretty connected. They all, we all talk to each other and we're seeing 10 to 15 percent response rate is pretty much on what people are saying. It's been really successful. I know Vermont did really well getting to the sales of 250 or 600. And that's for just the personnel numbers. The data collection, what person is calling the, um, you know, the users, the devices, um, applications, service plan information. Uh, barriers to adoption. This, that's kind of what they're asking agencies to write on. We asked for a bunch of cat data, though, and I think 40% response rate across my cat data, and I got like, oh, no, 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 no. So they gave us a picture. I mean, granted, it's on highways that are at least a picture to sustain. Initially, I was Oh, Alright, how's it going? Yeah. Sure. I know, well, I get the. So we won't be able to do it while you're gone, but if there's any questions yeah, you know, relating to first, I'm just going to Yeah, we can talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, they uh, all, they're all pretty uh, engaged. Oh, so no, we, don't, we, don't, we don't really say, you know, we say uh, first, we just need it. This is a public safety LTE network. We need to opt in, opt out, get it from it. Where do you get it from? Is it social well, and Rivada is actually the group, it's 
And I'm the Public Safety Broadband Program Manager at the Colorado Governor's Office of Information Technology. Um, we're going to go around the room and do introductions real quick, and then we have a few people who are watching this via web stream as well. Uh, but first, I want to introduce Rob Dew and Sean Ward, and they're both Department of Homeland Security Office of Information presenting the presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, uh, a couple of logistics, sorry. Bathrooms are out and to the right. Uh, you know where your exits are at if you need to <laughs> leave. And then uh, there's water and coffee right now, and I will actually be disappearing here in a few minutes. I'm going to grab our lunch. We'll do a short 20-minute break to get our food, and then we'll come back and finish the session and hopefully get out of here 1.30-ish. Is that okay, the, the goal, I think? So, All right, thanks. Thanks, Kim. Um, do I need to kind of stay in that area? Yeah. area? We're okay. streaming through the computer. We both, Rob and I, have done this presentation several times, and we tend to wander around the room. So if you start wandering, somebody just say, "Come back to the to the presentation area." So. Uh, right someone there. Okay. Someone's <laughs> watching. Someone, someone doesn't like that already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're, if you're on the line, if you could mute. <laughs> I did not bring my kids to the presentation, but that's how they sound. <laughs> All right. Uh, every, sounds like everything good is good now? I think so. Great. All right. Uh, my name is Sean Ward. Uh, I'm here with Rob Dew, support the Office of Emergency Communication, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Dan Hawkins is the regional coordinator from the Office of Emergency Communications, and he is here. and. Uh, Dan is, is, is typically the guy that when you need a regional belly button for OEC, he's, he's the man to go to. So. And he always comes to me, so he's always out in the field of meeting with folks and he has some great relationships across the two states. Uh, we're going to be presenting today um, on understanding public safety broadband. Uh, we've learned that as we do these presentations, we did a couple in Utah recently, we were in Maryland a couple weeks ago. Um, we don't know how technical we're going to get in the presentation because we always kind of uh, take the lead of the audience and, and folks who are, who are attending the training. Um, so we may get into some weeds on certain topics, but we may keep it uh, at a higher level on other topics. But feel free to please ask questions as we go through, go through the session. 
Uh, again, the Office of Emergency Communications has, has done uh, several of these uh, training sessions. And basically what we're trying to do is to, to talk to first responders, talk to IT people, talk to uh, the leaders in the states on the different, number one, uh, what LTE is from a technical standpoint, uh, the growth of public safety data and how you're going to be using public safety data when when the National Public Safety Broadband Network comes online, uh, but also the differences between radio and LTE, which is, is they're very, very different. Uh, so we get into some of that as well. Uh, and again, ask questions as, as, we, as we go through this. Um, Sorry, we're having a slight technical issue. We're trying to advance our slides just, just to give us a second. Okay. All right, so um, today is broken up into uh, a few key pieces. Number one, uh, we'll, we'll talk about broadband data and public safety, how you currently use uh, data in the field. If you don't use data in the field, that's certainly a possibility, but we'll talk about uh, what we're seeing in, in other states and other agencies. Talk a little bit about documenting user requirements uh, and how those requirements will uh, move over to, to FirstNet and how they will uh, and let Kim talk about the process she's going through with, with FirstNet and collecting all of this fun data from everybody across the state. Uh, then we'll talk about the infrastructure components of LTE. Uh, then we'll get into more specifics of an LTE network and uh, the LTE network. Uh, so any questions on the agenda before we move forward? Kim, do you want to this sound? No. And so this can be uh, more technical or more operational, and I've shared with Sean and Rob that we're going to, you guys are more operational people, and so at the point, if it becomes too technical, raise your hand and say, hey, you lost us, and we can we can modify our reply to ensure that the content is relevant to you and how you um, are uh, uh, working in your communities. So we don't want it to be uh, a waste of time where, you know, if we get so deep on LTE to, uh, engineering that it doesn't provide value to you. So before we move forward, first of all, we have to say we're not from FirstNet, we're from the Office of Emergency Communications. We cannot speak on behalf of FirstNet, we don't speak on behalf of their timeline or anything like that. Kim is, from a state perspective, is, is the point of contact for... Our office. office is the point of contact, I'm not the point of contact. Gotcha. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. Sure. So uh, that's uh, the first housekeeping item. Uh, Second, let's go around and, and talk, uh, have everybody report out on whether you're from fire, whether you're from police, EMS. Uh, you want to, let's just go around the room real quick and, and have everybody introduce themselves. You want to start? Joe Williams, Delta County, IT Department. Okay. Uh, Carl Stevens, Garfield County Emergency Communication Reporting on the Night Center, and I'm also the ESAP rep in the forum. Steve Trevor, High Fire, and I'm on the CS and CCNC. I'm John Davy, I'm the project coordinator with uh, Prison of Colorado. I'm Dan Hawkins, I'm the regional coordinator for OEC for the Rocky Mountain region, six state region, that includes Colorado and Utah and a couple other, other states. Um, just as a matter of background, mine is primarily operational. Uh, previous law enforcement for a number of years, statewide public safety communications consulting work, working in this field five years with the uh, dark side with the federal government. So. I'm Jennifer Dinsmore, I'm the Simeo County Sheriff's Office, and I'm emergency management. I'm also the chair of the All Hazard Region. And then I'm uh, for about 10 years. I'm Linda Belkin, um, director, dispatch director. Um, I'm basically, I don't no longer dispatch, but I'm basically the management of 35 years of 
technology and try to stay abreast of it. Probably Johnson Dell County. We can try the people on the phone. Yeah. Uh, you want or to... they can just chat me. Okay. Yeah, if they want to try, I don't know. All right. Does anybody want on the phone want to chime in and uh, do the roll call? Great, thank you. Next. Thank you. Next. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. Uh, as we mentioned, we're from the Office of Emergency Communications. Uh, Office of Emergency Communications is, is part of the Department of Homeland Security. OEC has been around close to 10 years now. Uh, uh, you know, with interoperability issues being so prevalent, especially in land mobile radio, uh, over the last 20, 30 years, uh, it was really nice to see the Office of Emergency Communications get created. Uh, OEC basically uh, deals heavily with interoperability, uh, voice communications, but over the last couple of years has, has started to look into the, the mobile data side, uh, the site hardening side, and the resiliency side of, of communications. Uh, and also the 911 side. Uh, so all of these pieces of technologies are, are coming together uh, in the field, and OEC has, has taken a lead here to, to understand them, understand all of the governance issues uh, that reside with this, the technology issues, the procedural issues, uh, and the training issues uh, around all of this. So it sounds like a lot of folks in here are from the 911 PSAP side. So we were just talking earlier that the PSAP is becoming kind of the center point uh, at the local level uh, for all of these technologies because uh, what we're hearing, what we heard in Maryland uh, just a couple of weeks ago is that the commanders in the PSAP and the leads in the PSAP are having to deal with lots of different issues, uh, with, whether it's requests from the public for 911 data, requests from the public on body cams and, and video and things like that, uh, or requests from the media, the PSAP is becoming the center for that. So, uh, you all, I'm sure, have, are starting to see that if you haven't seen it already. Uh, but with all the different technologies that support public safety, we're seeing the PSAP has become kind of the center. Um, so today's Office of Emergency Communications, we do three primary things, planning and preparedness. I know, Kim, you said you worked on the SKIP plan. Uh, we've done SKIP plans and updates in all, in all the states and territories. Uh, we developed the National Emergency Communications Plan, which kind of is kind of like the Bible uh, for emergency communications priorities for, for DHS. And most of that NECP is focused on state and local issues. Uh, OEC prides itself on being able to focus heavily on state and local issues and all of the governance and procedural issues uh, that affect you all at a state and local agency and all of the, the issues you have to deal with when you respond to these uh, to these incidents. Uh, coordination, uh, Dan is, is one of the key points of coordination here. We have regional coordinators in all, in all the 10 regions aligned to all the FEMA regions, correct? Well, we, we call them the DHS regions, the GSA regions. I gotcha. Okay. OEC is not FEMA. I know. I, I'm just dating myself from the FEMA standpoint. But. Okay, so there are coordinators in each region. These coordinators are, are responsible for understanding the needs and priorities of of their customers, uh, state and local customers in that area, including the federal agencies as well. Uh, technical assistance, which we're actually out here on technical assistance. Uh, we provide over 100 technical assistance uh, workshops each year typically, and the SWIC of the state is the one. Who's the SWIC of? Okay. Jack Cobb. Jack Cobb. So the SWIC of the state is the one who requests technical assistance from OEC. And the technical assistance we provide can, can range from 
uh, COML training to 911 training to cyber training. Um, you name it, we do have a catalog online if you want to go through that and feel free to, to work with the SWIC if you want to make a request. Uh, and then response, uh, OEC manages the, the wireless priority service, um, the GETS program, the Government Emergency Telecommunications Service, and also um, TSP, uh, Telecommunications Service Priority. Uh, and when uh, incidents happen and, and uh, networks go down or networks are overloaded, those uh, programs and those technologies come into play. And uh, just recently found that uh, during the the, uh, the Navy Yard event in Washington, D.C. area, uh, the GETS and wireless party services was heavily in that process because everything uh, commercial system going on. So uh, that's one of our uh, response services. Any okay. questions on OEC? Yes, sir. On, on the, the response side, I might add within OEC, the regional coordinators are designated federal emergency response officials. And that designation is for telecommunications emergencies, essentially. In the case of a large scale emergency or disaster where there's impact of communications, there could be uh, federal level activation services to support state, local, tribal, and federal agencies to restore or supplement tactical communications. And uh, through OEC, we support that nationally in our individual regions. Thanks, Dan. Um, OK, let's, uh, let's move into broadband data and public safety. Um, one of the things that we like to, to focus on initially uh, because there is a lot of confusion in the, in the field, uh, even at the federal government level, on what is happening with LTE. Is LTE going to take over voice communications? Is it going to take over our, we're not, we're not going to fo focus on our land mobile radio networks anymore? Uh, so we use this slide to try to drive home uh, a very important point, or the next set of slides to drive home some important points. First of all, the radio communications that you have, that your officers and firefighters wear on their belt, have in their cruisers and their uh, fire trucks, those are sticking around for, for, for quite a while. Uh, that is the only communication system that they have now that is mission critical. So their voice communications that they uh, use every day to call dispatch, to, to coordinate with each other, to respond to an incident, they're using the radios, they're using the Lambo radio network, that is mission critical. That is built to withstand, uh, in most cases, built to withstand uh, Weather events built to withstand, uh, it has site hardening uh, aligned to those LMR sites, and it can withstand uh, either natural or man-made disasters. So right now, land mobile radio is a primary voice communications uh, for public safety, and that is not going away. You can see the red line here shows that that's mission critical. Now, the other part of the, the current state is that, oh, so yeah. Sorry, I was confused by the display here. Uh, if you look on the, the left side, all of the data that your officers and firefighters are using, uh, for the, unless uh, you do have a, a private network, most all the data that they're using, either if they have mobile data computers in their cars or they're using their smartphones, that's all commercial and it's not considered mission critical. This is commercially available service. Uh, the officers and firefighters are basically just like any other user, uh, any other citizen who, who has a cell phone and uh, uses their, their smartphone to access the internet, they're not, your officers and firefighters are not getting any priority over the, the standard users now. Uh, so right now, uh, all of the mobile data uh, that they're doing is done over commercial networks and it's not mission critical. And then commercial voice, um, any, any voice communications they're using uh, that's not on their radio, that is also not mission critical. So they're using uh, basically commercial networks that have been built out for the, for the general public, and they also do not get priority service uh, over that, over those networks. The issue is currently, uh, you know, from a commercial standpoint, anytime you're using mobile data or using their commercial voice, they're susceptible to site outages, congestion, and coverage issues. Those coverage, uh, coverage was built 
on, from the commercial network standpoint uh, for the basically where the population is. So when your officers and firefighters respond in the field, they respond, uh, if they respond to an area that's very rural, they're probably not going to have very good uh, good commercial So right now, the current state is land mobile radio is the only mission critical network. The other uh, commercial voice and data is not mission critical. So that's our current state. Now let's look at the immediate goal. This is where FirstNet comes in. Again, we don't speak for FirstNet, but based on what we've heard, this is what's going to happen. So everybody's going to keep their land mobile radio. Uh, they're going to keep their radios. They're going to keep the networks in place. But the first goal and the initial goal uh, for, for FirstNet and uh, over the next couple of years is to make the mobile data piece mission critical. So you'll still have your radio, but that mobile data piece, once FirstNet gets built, is going to be mission critical. And I say that because they're going to uh, ensure that their, the sites are hardened when they build the sites or acquire the sites. They're going to make sure that they're more resilient and also have the preemption and, and priority uh, for first responders that first responders don't currently have when they're using mobile data. Everybody, any questions on that? So land mobile radio is not going away, uh, but when FirstNet is built, uh, the network will provide mobile data and data uh, for first responders, and that will be mission critical. However, there's still no voice uh, that will be mission critical uh, for, for FirstNet. Now the long-term plan, we don't know how many years this will be. Rob, chime in if you want. But the long-term plan is to have land mobile radio as mission critical, but also to have mobile data and uh, commercial voice as, as mission critical. So first net voice as mission critical. So hopefully, in several years, you're going to have first responders, every time they push to talk, either whether, whether it's on their radio, whether it's on a smartphone, or whether they're uh, Pushing video to a PSAP is all going to be uh, uh, an mission critical framework so they can make sure it gets to what it needs to get. Yeah, I'll just add so there, there's a standards body that handles the LTE standards for the commercial world. It's called the Third Generation Partnership Program. And they're starting to put a lot of public safety functionality into the standards. They kind of start, well, they could say they started with release 8, that was the initial release. Uh, but release 10 was just deployed in the US. Release 11 is coming up. Release 11, and we'll talk about it a little bit in the, uh, further in the presentation. Uh, but the, the key point is they just started working on mission critical push to talk on LTE. They just formed a standard body, the group working group for that late last year. So it's going to take them a couple years to do the standards. It'll probably be 2016, 2017 before it gets written in standards. Then you have to have products come out that'll productize it. So it could be anywhere five years, something like that. But even when mission critical push to talk, assuming that the technology works and it deploys well on LTE, you still might not have LTE coverage in the places that you have LMR coverage now. So, you know, we don't see the LMR uh, uh, networks going away for mission critical voice. You know, it could be, no one really knows. It could be 10 years, it could be 15 years. But certainly for the next five to 10 years, uh, you know, we feel you'll be still relying on your LMR networks for mission critical. Okay, let's talk a little bit about mobile data. Um, is, uh, just by a show of hands, does, does anybody have uh, first responders in this area that, that have mobile data computers in their cruisers? One, two, okay. Uh, how long have they had them? Um, we've had one that's had, well, we've had two that have had it for several years, and we've had one our major astronaut's office is going for. Are you, are you using LTE right now for uh, data use, like an enterprise contract with a carrier? Or yeah, some like, of them I think are still on free. Okay, so it's EVDO or HSPA or something. And what uh, what types of applications are they using? What what are they doing with their computers? They can see CAD and they're also in the law record, uh, in car records as well. So they can read car, in car report. Okay. How about you, Okay. Six and a half years. And he has LTE, you know, the car and the right? They're all still 
access, databases. What is coverage like? I assume they're using virtual networks. What's coverage like for them when they're responsible for that field? For us, generally, uh, probably way up in the North Fork, it's, there's some spots that are weak. We have an antenna and extra appurtenances to bring in the signal. They'll just move this spot where they can communicate. So it's really not too, too much of a problem. Plus, they're going to be putting towers reportedly up in that area soon. So it wouldn't be that um, One thing that, that we, the OEC did a uh, survey, and it's still actually an open survey, but based on a thousand submissions, uh, all the survey tool, 59% of, of respondents said that, that data is mission critical. But for many years, we looked at voice as being the mission critical piece, and it always will be, because uh, you don't necessarily need to see video when, you need it when you're calling for help. But mission critical data, data is becoming a mission critical uh, item for public safety. Uh, certainly, a lot, of, a lot of times it comes down to if you haven't had it, you don't you don't know what you're missing. But once you get it, then you feel like I can't deal with, I can't live without this. I can't can't live without seeing mug shots real time or streaming video real time. Uh, so it's becoming much more important. And I will say that that seeing in urban areas uh, where their the commercial networks are, are built out. Uh, it's it's becoming um, mission critical much more quickly than it would. What is, is Dave have any comments on that? Does everybody agree with that? The mission critical data is becoming mission critical. Is anybody hearing any of that from their <coughs> responders? All I know is is an area where we don't have mobile data terminals just because there's areas we don't even have radio coverage. Right. We're in a very mountainous. Um, I do know that, that our dispatch received more and more requests from the officers for information to be sent to them via email so they can try and obtain as much as they can. Um, so I, I can see the huge impact in the future on the data um, and the need for the data to be in the vehicle. We're constantly sending them What about smartphones? Are the board agents provide smartphones to officers and responders? Anybody who does not? No. That we just buy cams and then get store. It's huge. So, so with the body more cams are you going at the end of shifts and just putting them into they a cage and then they're not it. Yes, so they're sir. not really looking at anything real time yet. They, they see it. They can. Real -time. If I put the clients on their NDCs, they can watch it right there, but they can edit it on the ground, field, and things like that. As we see, I mean, uh, well, we have a slide coming up, but the general, you know, the general public has really moved a lot towards video. So, like, you know, Verizon in the next year, they think seventy percent of their traffic is going to be video, and uh, it's not multicast video. It's not the same video stream going to everyone, uh, and everyone's getting their own stream. And especially if you do that on the uplink from the terminal up to the tower, you can quickly sync even an LTE network. I mean, if you look at a I was up in Philadelphia, and they're doing a lot of trials with uh, body-worn cameras, and they looked at all the vendors, and they're looking at 720 PhD cameras, not 1080, uh, but those can go from 2.2 gigabytes to 2.7 gigabytes an hour of content if you're doing it constantly. Well, if you were to stream that real time at the low end of that, that's 5 megabits per second, and that's a very fast coupling, even on LTE. In fact, if you're at the edge of a cell's coverage in LTE, you probably won't even be able to do that. You're going to have to go shift down to SD or your uh, standard definition video or move closer to the cell site. So, you know, it, all the applications you're using now, you may be limited by, you know, data caps on your enterprise uh, contracts with the carriers, or maybe you had congestion, you were competing with the public. But, you know, once we see LTE broadband for public safety starts really spreading out there, we don't see any reason why it won't, won't go more towards video similar to what the public's done. So there's going to be a very big data demand, but you, know, you, you, you would be the experts in your use cases to see even if you think you have a need for video on the downlink uh, or the uplink. This takes money. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, we're definitely hearing in all the sessions that the procedural issues that go along with the enhancements in data 
and body worn cameras, the, 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 the video that you're uploading and trying to manage and store, stored in a cloud, you store locally. All these issues uh, are becoming uh, certainly a management, a management problem for police, fire, EMS. Uh, but also, if you look at the personal uh, BYOD side, the bring your own device side, where you have officers and firefighters who are using their own devices, you have the procedural issues there, the policy issues there. How is it, is it, has, it, has it been dealing with that at the local level uh, with officers and firefighters using their own devices, potentially using it to support their, their job day to day? We just have one device, and they can use it professionally. Uh, we have time where we are because you know we don't usually go over a lot of data because we don't have opportunities for them to go over it usually because we have uh, sparse. But you know our towns, of course, not the village and they have. Yeah, they're using everything. Question: I presume they use those devices if it's telephone. Not just data, right? Yeah. How is that an important to Telephone ability? Oh yeah, for our officer. Yeah, I think that's that's the question. We're talking mission critical voice. Most typically, we're alluding to the push to top, right? Traditional type of one to many, many to one mm -hmm. type of communications. But there's another type of voice, and that's telephone. Right. Maybe maybe Kim can answer this. And she may have most recent information. This. Is FirstNet talking about deploying telephone voice in its uh, early rollout? So I don't know the answer to that. I do know that FirstNet has said they plan to do voice over LTE. And I don't know if by 2018, which is when they said that's when you'll first see the network, if commercially you'll see a migration of voice over LTE and that will replace the 2G G cellular voice capability. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that either. but. That might be how they're supporting non-mission critical voices, voice over LTE. Yeah, I think they would offer it. I mean, as, as long as you're not communicating, you know, uh, PII or, you know, uh, certain information that you would be worried about uh, going over a commercial network that may not have the encryption that you might expect from a dedicated network. But certainly, I think that they would they would allow you to fall back to that. I mean, they would offer it. It just wouldn't be one of these things where they can tell you it's mission critical, it's got all the... Uh, built-in capability that, that a mission critical push to talk would have and you know Volte Volte took a while to do you know Verizon was talking about doing it years ago and they finally started deploying it late last year on a couple of handsets nationwide you know AT&T was deploying it in, in kind of uh, cities here and there so as Kim was saying you know people are just getting used to Volte and you know it's going to take a, a while you know years for that migration off of circuit switch you know CDMA well, GSS going 2017, but uh, CDMA and, uh, and UMTS, the 3G voice technology, is going to take a while for people to migrate over to uh, the Volte. And plus, the carriers need to actually have the Volte. They've got LTE coverage, but they've also got to have the Volte coverage matching the circuit switch coverage, which a lot of carriers have told us, you know, in the next couple of years, they're going to try to have parity with that. They're going to, so they're, because for the carriers, it's expensive to operate all these different technologies, right? They would love to just put everything on LTE. They don't have to operate multiple uh, multiple technologies, but yeah, um, the public's just getting used to Vaulty, so you know, public safety is going to take some years. So in the initial, uh, in some of the, the pilots that are going on, do those have, uh, those just have the data piece on it? They don't have the, the uh, commercial voice on it? Yeah, and we can pass this around. This is a Sonom Android device, it's a hardened device, and they want us to do that, so <laughs> um, I could chuck it. Um, right now, it's on the Wi-Fi, but we'll pass this around. It's not locked. You can just um, push the lock on it, and it'll open for you. But it does not do cellular voice currently. Um, it's really a data device. I think um, as they work with the at and and Verizon, Sonom, the manufacturer, it will have that capability, but this device does not. How secure does that when it comes to being an Android device? You know, they've got some, some real holes in their security. Right. No, that has not been addressed either. This is really, the, the function of this device at this point is twofold. It's to show you the hardened, what a hardened device would look like okay. in the future. And then number two is to show you this device. Actually, I live in, live in Adams County where we have a public safety um, pilot network. 
and I can access the Adams County Public Safety Private Network with this device. So that's really its function today. And so does it actually have the security built in to make you just compliance with not, not in its, not in this not it's in correct. Yeah, they'll be having to Will address they be that. To they'll have to address time? that. Yeah, for for it to be marketed to public safety, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, right. so, but not in <laughs> no, no, not in its current format. Just so. at the bottom, at your pass and procedures, compliant data over commercial networks, and I'm probably doing it through a virtual private network, some form of right. encryption. That same approach would work across other types. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they'll have to have VPNs. And you know, when you set up VPNs and you do IP sex, sure. uh, you do IPv6, you know, then you start, you know, then you start eating into the capacity to have the extra encryption and security. But sure. yeah. But that device, no, does not do any of that. And, and, and the really the, 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 the very interesting thing about that, and we'll talk about a couple slides, is that has band class 14 capability. So that can actually transmit inside the, the band that's been given exclusively to, uh, to first for public safety. And there's very few devices that have that band class right now. I would suggest that between mission critical and not mission critical, it's great, but I'd like to point Right. And you see a lot of officers or agencies or whoever using their cell phone a lot for <coughs> stuff that's almost mission critical. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, I, I, you know, that's, Along with this new technology, you know, there's going to have to be concept of operations. But you're right, when, when uh, officers and, and first responders are using their, their own personal smartphone, you know, unless they, there's identity management and different profiles in there for work versus personal, you know, there's, the, the, I always say about this, the technology is always the easy part. It's always the policy, the governance, and the operations, and how you use that technology is a difficult part. And you don't have to tell the officer, you know, what sort of, you know, you can't send person identifiable information. You shouldn't be sending that over, you know, a, a non-VPN, you know, on, on the commercial network. So, you know, what's the, uh, there's going to be a lot of training in how first responders use this technology and what can they do on cellular, uh, well, cellular voice or, or multi-voice, you know, what, what do they do on band class 14 data, which we're going to talk about in a minute, or the commercial side of the data, because they're going to have a phone that can access a lot of different technologies and access a lot of different uh, networks and frequency bands. And what do they do when, and how do you make that easy for them so that they're not thinking about all that and they can, they can be doing their job? It's going to be, it's going to be really, it's the operational side is, Really, going to be the hardest part of uh, of, of uh, LTE public safety, not really the technology. One of the things we, we try to push at OEC is uh, first that's coming in a, in a few years, but you're dealing with mobile data right now. You're dealing with all of these smartphone issues and procedural issues, you can't really wait until first that gets here, then have to deal with all of these governance, SOP, procedural issues. So think about these uh, issues now, like. When your officers are using their personal cell phones, what are they using them for? How are you securing it? Um, ensuring that the identity management process is, is down and also the security piece. Um, because we were talking earlier, if, if you're in a foot chase and you, you your smartphone in the foot, foot chase, what's your what's your procedure? Uh, and it's their personal smartphone. You have a procedure. They have taken evidence pictures of the day on that on that smartphone. So uh, agencies are having to deal with these things now, um, and OEC is trying to trying to get folks to focus on them now, so that when dealing with uh, personnel coming down the line, pushing out these these smartphones, you have you have a good runtime to to deal with these things in the upper systems and policies. I think one of the big things you see is is uh, Officers, especially detectives, will use their cell phones for a good portion of what they do day to day. Because they're doing, uh, they're talking to people on the phone, they're making lots of phone calls. Uh, it's just different. If you, you know, typically, if you're in uniform and responding, your radio is your priority, but if you're uh, following up on investigations, you're using your phone much more than you Any questions on, on the mobile data piece? Um, anything anybody wants to add on their use of mobile data? What does everybody see coming uh, in the near future, just on the commercial side? Does anybody have plans to, to push out more smartphones to folks with new MDCs in the cars? Anybody working through that process now? You know, one of the things that <coughs> the sheriff's had me looking at because we do have a limited 
for lack of a better, you know, tower coverage, for lack of a better terminology, and CAD systems being incredibly expensive. We are looking into an alternate commercial ABL type program um, to where we can connect the devices to on that without having to pay the exorbitant amount of for a free agency center. So we start looking at that. So I do see that <clears throat> especially from a smaller agency standpoint, we're going you're going to start seeing people reaching out more to those more cost effective um, type of devices that uh, to track on babies. Especially where it's just it's tough to find the money. I think somebody brought up earlier what is the what are your citizens demanding of you? you know, with when we I'm gonna get to this next slide, we look at we do our after action courses in what's called the voice communications ecosystem. Um, 911, text to 911, we look at um, both radio and mobile data. We also look at uh, the technologies used to, to push alerts out, put alerts and warnings information, uh, but also the social media side, how do uh, uh, citizens communicate with each other and communicate with partners during an emergency. So citizens uh, you know, are much more savvy typically than then we are are saying, what well, did you get this? Did you get my post on Twitter? <laughs> God, who are you? I, I I don't know if we got it or not. Agencies, especially the piece after having to deal with this. So what are you seeing from your citizens? Are they demanding change and you can't afford the change or you can't afford the process to, to get to that? I haven't noticed any of that. But I have I know that you know we're gonna have to Covid, um, and of course it's, it's always worse for us. The citizen outcry is more, you know, is much greater than when the made us on right. But I do know that our citizens really do rely heavily on those two um, types of communication. And the officers tweeting from the field, your any response? Okay. Well, I, I brought up the ecosystem. This is it can be kind of a confusing graphic, but if you look at I'm sure the pointer is working. I'm just gonna Here, yeah, you can do it. Is it working now? So we use this uh, when we do after action reports, basically uh, it's broken into four segments. The right segment is the citizen communicating with the government or public safety. Uh, it's broken down into the types of technologies or systems that are used, and it's broken down into the types of information that's shared. Uh, the top segment is government to government, how public safety communicates with each other or with other government agencies using mission critical voice, backup voice, and also data. On the left side is how the government communicates with citizens. The technology is there, and we break it down to outdoor warning systems, which are very, are very basic and have been around a long time. But it's something that, that we often think about in the emergency communications context. Uh, priority or proprietary notification systems, EAS, uh, emergency alerting, you name it. And then the bottom is the citizen to citizen, how they're communicating with each other, and that includes amateur radio. We know that amateur radio is a big deal when. Everything else doesn't work. Amateur radio is typically still there to communicate. Um, so this is how we look, how OEC looks at uh, emergency communications from all these pieces. Now we don't have the time or money to focus on all these pieces. We still rely, we still focus heavily on the, the mission critical voice and 911 and mobile data. Um, as a as a public safety manager, if you're managing a PSAP or your commander, you have to think of all these pieces because your citizens are going to be demanding you to think about all these pieces. So this is how we kind of look at the mobile data world is growing so big. It's not just about LMR anymore. It's about all these other moving parts and all the policies and procedures. And then we use this Rubik's Cube, gra Rubik's Cube graphic. You see Land Mobile Radio and that front, that front piece is all the issues related to Land Mobile Radio. 
On the top is mobile data and all the issues you have to deal with there. And then the, the right side is 911. That's that's OEC's focus. Um, so all of these different different issues with standards, priority, and SOPs, things like that. Any, any comments on this? Does it make sense? All right, so um, we're going to talk quickly about documenting user requirements in the consultation process. Do you, are you, do you want to give everybody an update on the process? Sure. Um, uh, so we actually have a first pass of data due to FirstNet on September 30th. I think you're all on our newsletter list. We've been kind of bombarding agencies, asking them to participate through our Google form. We don't use the MDST. I know you guys will hit on that a little bit. We use a Google form uh, because Colorado is a Google shop now. And we're really just seeking uh, information on the number of users, devices, applications, kind of general information on the service plans, and then any barriers to adoption. We know cost and coverage oftentimes are the, the biggest barriers. And that information is going to go to FirstNet on September 30th, um, in addition to input on what we think Colorado's initial pass on coverage should look like for, uh, that will inform the RFP that FirstNet um, has said they plan to publish at the first of the year. And then they'll be in an RFP process for pretty much all of 2016. That will not stop us from continuing to gather user requirements because uh, I kind of consider the relationship between the states and the first net, especially once the RFP gets published, is a negotiation, right? It's going to be a discussion with them about what our requirements are, and those are going to change in the next two years as they go to RFP and select a partner or partners. And then we, um, our requirements are going to change internally because agencies are going to change the way they do operations. Carrier coverage hopefully will improve for all of you guys in the commercial space over that time, which will impact what our coverage requirements are on. So it's going to be an ongoing conversation. It's kind of the way I see it. Great. Yeah. And when, um, when FirstNet's focusing on coverage and the way we're, we're advising folks in the field is basically um, FirstNet's interested in where do you need coverage and consider this, this is mobile data coverage. Where you need mobile data coverage uh, is the first piece and then how many users do you have? Because the number of users drive the capacity and, and other topics as well. So. How many users do you have? What are they going to be doing at those locations? So specifically, uh, not just the, the standard day-to-day -day operational locations, but areas where you might have uh, an event once a year, or you might have a, a, a major event like a football game or something like that. Where are you going to have a large number of users uh, in a certain ge in a certain geography, and what do they need to be doing there? So I know Kim has been working with this as part of the, the why, you're, why she's collecting all of the data for FirstNet is to try to drive towards what this coverage, this first, uh, this first uh, draft of coverage is going to be. So I was happy to hear somebody from the GIS side was GIS person. So uh, one of the biggest benefits that we've seen in the field is when you have really strong uh, people who can do the mapping and, and put in the different layers of coverage and Rob will, uh, Rob will talk a lot about this in the social data as well. But the better you know your, your coverage requirements based on real data, uh, the better that negotiation process is going to go that, that, that Kim alluded to, uh, the better case you can make for why you need coverage in certain. Uh, so Rob has a couple of, of really cool slides that looks at social data, looks at the, the movement of people uh, either on hiking trails. I don't know what else. What else do you have in there? Um, so oh, it's, it's uh, well. When we get to it, it's basically you know the, uh, a lot of the census data you see is where people live and work. But you've got things like Burning Man in Nevada. You've got Manhattan's a great example. You know they'll say there's three million people there, but then it goes up over nine million during the day. So uh, what we tend to look at is a lot of geotag social data. So it, uh, you know, and I think I'll, I'll save it when I get to there. But basically, it gives you a much better idea of where people are moving and clustering during the day. And ultimately, for public safety, their goal is protecting loss and property. So if you know where the public is most likely to be at any given time during a 24-hour period, uh, that will help you when you look at actually your site placements to get that as close to where you see the public congregating. Or when your negotiations with FirstNet, when they pick a carrier, like say a Verizon or an AT&T or whoever is their infrastructure partner, when you look at those sites, you want to make sure those sites that they're recommending 
uh, for putting the LTE public safety uh, band class 14 equipment on aligns with where you see the public and where you see the biggest risk for, for uh, life and loss of property. But we'll, we'll get into that a bit more. I just want to make one point on the commercial coverage, by the way. Uh, you know, this is a lot of marketing stuff, so this is not necessarily guaranteeing that you're going to get. We know marketing versus when you go do drive tests and you take what we call an LTE scanner and you go out and actually scan what the throughput is. It's, uh, it, it's quite a bit different in terms of coverage and capacity. So I just want to make it clear these are kind of marketing. So if you see an area you know where coverage isn't any good, you know, that, and it, it also it wouldn't just be LTE. You know, this is 3G, 2G. It's all uh, commercial mobile uh, uh, technologies uh, together. Um, and, you know, when commercial providers are building their networks, they're looking at population primarily. But you have a very different, uh, very different problem to attack in this. So the more data you have, the better data you have, the better analysis you do, the better you'll be able to identify where those coverage areas are. So these, these are some uh, static maps you've had in here for, for a while. These are your critical infrastructure. You can just pull these from, from some of the data we had. I'm sure you guys have uh, many data sets on this. In Google Earth. Uh, your public safety population, how many agencies do you have, how many officers, firefighters, sworn, uh, police officers, but also uh, fire uh, firefighters who are both uh, volunteer and professional. Uh, you have to include all those pieces. Let me just end on the OEC tools. I know you mentioned the mobile data survey tool. Uh, state, uh, I think we have about 26 or 27 states using the mobile data survey tool. Uh, to collect data on the, the cost of commercial mobile data currently and user data, things like that. Sounds like you've moved to a different process. Uh, OEC also has Chasm Next Gen, which uh, plots uh, right now land mobile radio locations. You can get access from your SWIC to go in. Your SWIC, I believe, has to go in and, and make those changes. But OEC has, has uh, tools on public safety tools.info to, to help you through the process. So, uh, Rob and I are going to tag team uh, this infrastructure components piece. Not sure where the questions will go. If they go technical, Rob can respond to them. Uh, but we just want to talk the basics of LTE. Uh, first thing we start with is always the 700 megahertz band allocation. If you look at uh, what FirstNet has been able to get, uh, originally, the D block here was aligned to public safety and it's about it's 10 megahertz of uh, in the 700 megahertz band. Uh, first that was able to uh, through a lot of a lot of work on Capitol Hill, a lot of negotiations, a lot of advocacy, basically get 20 megahertz of LTE spectrum in this process, which the way we look at it is this is beachfront spectrum. This is, this is a lot of spectrum. If you look at it from a comparative to if you look at Verizon, what does Verizon have? 22 megahertz in 700? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're at 20 by 20, yeah. Yep. Well, this is a lot of spectrum for public safety. This is, this is a, a really great thing for public safety. This is why uh, you know, things are, are really looking positive for public safety to be able to use this network because it, it has uh, number one, it has the spectrum, which is always uh, always hard to get. Anything on, on this, Robert? No, I think that's good. Yeah, just keep in mind, you know, this is, when we talk about band class 14 on the uplink and downlink, it's 10 megahertz up and 10 megahertz down simultaneously, so it's a frequency division duplex system. And so we talk about band class uh, 14, we're talking about this upper 700 megahertz, 758 to 768, 788 to 798. So that's we talk about the design slides later on, and when we say a band class 14 site, that means like a cell site or what they call an evolved D-node B and LTE, it's going to be using these, these channels here. And you can see the commercial carriers are, you know, adjacent to them. So you say like a band class 13, you see is, uh, is, is Verizon, AT&T has in band uh, 17 and band 12. So this is very uh, lucrative real estate to have frequency spectrum. It's very good in terms of propagation out of rural and suburban areas. It also gives you good in building penetration, assuming that the building's not made out of that green stuff that reflects the 700 megahertz. But uh, in general, it's, it's a very prime spot. This is where all the carriers wanted to have uh, spectrum real estate for their LTE networks. So let's discuss the basics of the LTE network. Um, I know we, we do have uh, 
backup slides if anybody wants to get into the actual wire diagrams of this we, we do have those uh, basically four four key components four key layers number one the core this is the brains of, of an LTE network uh, where are the where's the core located or where will it be located uh, we've, we've got a chart coming up about that a little bit later but when we call the evolved packet core like Sean said it's kind of the brains of the network uh, you see here we've got user traffic and signaling so it breaks up what they call the control and user plane so signaling and traffic now the user traffic parts of the core most likely you want to have that distributed out to regions because that's carrying your traffic so you want to try to offload traffic as close to the edge of the network as possible to keep your backhaul costs down the signaling part, however, can be located a little bit further away. So we don't really know exactly how the core network for FirstNet is going to be or, or a core network would be for a LTE public safety network that you would deploy. You could have your own physical core components that are just for public safety, and then you share backhaul and towers with a commercial carrier. Uh, if you're doing a, a, a Volte, you're going to need something called an IMS core, where you may want to actually bring a little bit more of the processing further into the core. But I generally think for the purposes like here, you know, you might have signaling core components, for example, in Denver, but you may have uh, user traffic components, which they call a packet gateway or soft gateway uh, closer. So you might have one in Grand Junction if you have an internet site there. Uh, when you have these core components that handle the user traffic, ideally you want to locate them in network to network interface or data centers where you know there's a lot of backhaul and fiber and where carriers are. But you want to keep the, the user components that are carrying the traffic as far farthest to the edge of the network as possible. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of backhaul and transport costs. The signaling is a lot less uh, of a data rate, obviously, so you can bring that you know, maybe all the way up to, say, for example, Denver in this area. Signaling? Yeah, that's just so. So the traffic is all your, you know, data application. Signaling is is basically controlling the applications, like how you get your priority signaling to devices to do handovers between cell sites. It's basically the kind of commands of how the different components in the network are going to work. Whereas the the user traffic is actually you know, your voice call, your FTP, your video session, that sort of. Thing. Second is the transport. Uh, I know people have heard about backhaul fiber piece or the microwave will also be included correct Rob yeah, yeah. hopefully Ethernet micro <laughs> <laughs> right but uh, yeah so when you look at transport it's basically how uh, information gets from point A to point B uh, it's typically uh, fiber in the case of a, a microwave will also be involved uh, the next two are the ones that, that you'll probably be most involved in the radio access network which is uh, I guess most comparable to a LAM over radio network where you have sites uh, that provide the coverage uh, and the signaling and user traffic. And then uh, the funnest part really is the public safety user equipment, which is what everybody sees. This is really what's, what's going to be in your officer or firefighter's hands or in their cars. Um, and that's that's the final piece. And that's the piece we're going to be dealing with. Uh, the radio access network will deal a little bit with that uh, in looking at what your hazards are uh, in those areas. But FirstNet is going to be, obviously, intimately involved in all those pieces. Anything you want? Yeah, so this will be, you know, mostly you'll be negotiating, I suspect, with FirstNet on the radio access network. You know, where are sites going to be? Are they located in places that give coverage to your first responders in the capacity they need? You may get involved a little bit with the core network. Like I said, if you've got packet data networks or data networks that, 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 that you're, you're running your public safety applications over, you would want the first net core pieces to be co-located with those so that you, know, you don't have a lot of latency in terms of data transfer, you're not dealing with a lot of backhaul costs, but primarily most of it will be in the radio access network, where, where are the sites actually going to be placed to meet your coverage and capacity requirements. Does that make sense, or uh, how, how technical do you want um, us or Rob to get on some of this? If I start getting technical, <laughs> just go like this. Just bring it up, bring it up. What, what I'm going to try to do later on when we talk about the coverage and design is I'll, I'll try to go into a little bit of, of uh, the detail of it, but it's really more uh, some of the parameters that you should be looking for and some of the type of values. Like when you get, because as Kim was saying, uh, you're, you're collecting a lot of data now. The data is going to go into FirstNet. FirstNet is going to release their comprehensive network RFP early next year, and they need to have all this information from all the states so they know kind of what's the whole volume of, of, of really devices that, 
that they're looking at. So that when they negotiate with a carrier or an infrastructure uh, partner, uh, they can give them an idea of you know how big the network's going to be, how many users, how many devices. But then it, when, what's going to come out of that is probably, and I'm just guessing, maybe 2017, they're going to be bringing you state plans, which are going to be, okay, you gave us your coverage and capacity requirements. Here's, and based on the agreement we've done with our RFP winners, you know, which could be a nationwide carrier, could be content providers, we don't know. Uh, here's where we're, we're planning on putting your site to here how it's going to here, here's how it's going to be designed. But you're going to want to look for some certain values and parameters with that, like a signal to interference to noise ratio, you know, capacity and coverage plots showing cell edge throughput. You know, is this the kind of throughput that you want in that area? So I'm going to try not to go too much into detail, but I'll try to keep it at a high level. But if you can, I'll, I'll point out certain values or parameters or concepts to just keep in the back of your mind and, and hold on to these. Because, uh, you know, if you're part of the review with Kim and others of these state plans coming from first state, you're going to want to ask them, well, what about this, what about that? Have some idea of the, of the questions to ask during the negotiation. And so uh, let's take a walk back and just talk about the difference between LMR and LTE because there's a significant difference uh, in many, many aspects. But it is, it is not a one-to-one -one change -over, so, or, or transfer. So if you're using LMR now, Using your radio, you go to a certain location. You know you have coverage there. You can put 20 people in that area and still have the same the same coverage. Push to talk unless you're unless you're walking at each other and pushing and talk at the same time. You're going to have coverage. LTE is different. Uh, LTE. So let me just start. Let me just say what they. This slide and the next one are in your handouts because we were talking to Kim and, and she had said, you know, it might be good to do uh, some LMR comparison. So we'll have a PDF of the final one and you'll get a copy of it. So sorry, you don't have this slide and the next one in your presentation. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I just wanted to say that. No, continue. Hi. Oh, you want to? Okay. Okay. So, so I, I've been doing commercial wireless for about 20 years. I'm not an LMR expert, but I know that LMR designs are pretty much done to give you kind of a static and guaranteed coverage area for delivered audio quality or some kind of kilobits per second. In LTE, in LTE, you've got this 10 megahertz channel and you have different sectors and you're giving people data uplink and downlink at the same time at the same frequency. So you're sharing the same quote unquote channel at the same time in the city. Do you know what the concept of a sector is? And like, if you've got a, a cell site and you've got three sectors each covering 120 degrees, within each of those sectors, you're using the same, actually in all of the sectors, you're using the same channel at the same time and all the adjacent sites as well. Right. So, oh, okay. So LMR's got this, this kind of static coverage area where you've got a certain delivered audio quality and you're all having your own different channels in, inside of that. With LTE, in each of these sectors, you've got the same frequency uh, and, and, and the same, at the same time. And what happens is you get farther away from the site here, so I understand you're going to get a delivered audio quality here. It's going to be similar to the delivered audio quality you get at the cell edge. With LTE, it's much different because LTE is very efficiently using these time and frequency resources. So what happens is you go farther out here, you start dropping in capacity. Now, you'll have very high capacity here towards the center of the cell, but as you start moving out, you'll start dropping uh, capacity. And what happens is that if you start adding, you want to go ahead and keep so as you start adding users into that sector one there, you start slicing up the available capacity and throughput that you have in that sector. Now, for 10 megahertz, uh, the theoretical peak data, the data is going to be 150 megabits on the downlink, okay? But you're never going to see that. That would be an ideal situation. You're the only user on the cell. You're sitting right underneath the cell site. You've got no adjacent sites around you. You have the what they call a category five device, which can do different spatial multiplexing, can do very high modulation schemes. You're probably going to see something, and we'll show you, and I'll show you some of the designs that we did. You know, somewhere maybe 25 to 40 megabits actually on the downlink. But all of that has to be shared amongst a lot of different users. And they're doing different applications. Some are doing video, some are doing texting, some may be doing a multi-call, and they're all going to be sliced up differently, but they all have to use that same resource. Now, another thing, because all of these sectors are using the same frequency channel, 
you can't load up all these sectors 100%, right? Because if you get in, the, in between these sectors or you've got adjacent cell sites here, they're going to start interfering with each other, right? Because they're all using the same frequency at the same time. So the point here is that unlike LMR, where you go in these areas and you're, you're pretty much guaranteed a certain, uh, you can expect a certain delivered audio quality or a certain capacity, in LTE, it very much depends on where you are in the cell site, how many other users are around you. Because what are other users doing to you? They're causing you interference because you're all using the same um, resource. So does that does that does that make sense, or is there any uh, any questions about that? So from an operational perspective, you put a hundred responders in this coverage area, they're all going to be able to access that network, assuming they're not walking on each other. Put a hundred responders in a very small area here, they're all going to be sharing that spectrum. And it's going to limit how much data they're going to be able to access. You get 100 officers here who are all trying to access live video. That's going to be a problem. There's not enough. There's not enough spectrum. There's not enough uh, 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 capability to go around for everybody to get those. To, for everybody to access the type of data they want. So it's, it is very different. Now keep in mind, LMR is voice. It's not data, uh, but it does change the way operationally you think about coverage uh, and uh, ultimately it'll, it'll come down to when you know you have places that, that have a lot of responders in one area, you need to augment the system or first that we need to augment the system to provide uh, that coverage. Yes, go ahead. Yes, the, that's on the LTE side. Okay, uh, the first thing I did is I, I walked over to the LMR side and I said, you have 100 users here, and I'm just using 100 as, as, as just an example. Um, but you have 100 users on the LMR side, uh, and they're all going to be provided basically the same, the same coverage and the same access. But you put those same number of users who are, who are demanding different types of data on an LTE network, and they're limited in, in what they can do based on what, what their demands are and the throughput they have. Rob, you want to expand on that at all? Yeah, so yeah, the, the, the hundreds, uh, you know, was just an example, but yeah, you would assume the hundred. Uh, are spaced at different areas within that sector. So you might have some in the dark green, which means they're getting a higher modulation scheme or higher throughput. Some of them will be in the uh, the medium green, so they're at a lower modulation scheme, so their throughput decreases. And then some will be at the very light green, which is at the cell edge. And at the cell edge is an LTE where you really start to tax the resources of the cell. And we'll get into this in uh, the, some slides later on, but you usually design coverage in LTE uh, down to a minimum uh, cell edge throughput on the uplink and downlink, and that's usually somewhere, you know, 768 kilobits per second, one megabit per second, two megabits per second. But uh, in that scenario, uh, you can think of the orange uh, dot there in sector one. If this sector was designed for a minimum uh, downlink throughput of, say, one megabit per second, that one user, that one orange user, if they had a video stream that they were looking at uh, one megabit per second, they would be using all the resources in that sector. So all those different colors you see in the LTE spectrum bar, those would all go to orange if that user uh, was the only user in that cell and they were doing, say, one megabit per second if that's what the cell edge was designed for. So the thing in LTE to keep in mind is that there's, a, there's different modulation schemes and it's dynamically changing uh, the, the throughput that each user gets based on where they are in the cell and what type of application they're trying to do. And if you're towards the edge of the cell and you're trying to do a very high capacity uh, video uplink, uh, you may not be able to do it and you would have to move closer to the cell. Now the one thing that affects all of this are priority mechanisms that we'll get into a little bit later, but this is assuming you're treating every user uh, uh, equally and you're trying to serve them with, that, with those resources. Does that make sense? Or? Okay.
So Rob, I'm going to let you uh, talk through the deployment solutions and I'll, I'll chime in some operational pieces. So there are uh, five key depo deployment solutions for LTE. The three on the right here are fixed, small cells, macro cells, and boomer sites. And then the two on this side are deployable uh, solutions, which are either on net uh, deployable solution or, or an off net deployable solution. I'll let you go through the details of each. Okay, so uh, can you hear me on the on the conference bridge? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm just stepping away a little bit from the computer. So if we look at the far right, uh, typically uh, most of the population is, is concentrated in uh, dense urban, urban and suburban areas. So usually now capacity in LTE networks, which is very similar to other uh, wireless technologies, is really based on the bandwidth that you have, which we know is fixed. It's 10 megahertz up and 10 megahertz down. The cell spectral efficiency, or how many bits per hertz you can get out of each cell site, and the number of cells. So the 10 megahertz is limited. We can only get so many bits per hertz out of the uh, out of the cell, depending on how good the, the cell vendor is. So what we have to start doing is increasing the number of sites in a given area. So we know in dense urban, urban and suburban areas, we have uh, small cells, pico cells, femto cells, very small cells which are trying to concentrate more and more capacity in a much smaller area because the population density is much greater. And these are going to be typically uh, fixed cell sites, small cells going on light poles or indoor distributed antenna systems. Or, you know, they could be deployables, which might be brought in for a, for a special event or for an emergency in an urban area to even that. It starts decreasing and we start going out into suburban and kind of the outer parts of the city, you'll start getting into macro cell sites, which are bigger sites, they're covering a much wider area because there's simply not as many people uh, in that given area. So the cell sites start spreading out uh, apart from each other because you just don't have the density of population, you don't have the capacity. Uh, so you get out to macro cells, it could be one to 10 miles. You could also have in urban and suburban areas, you could have macro cells providing capacity as kind of like an umbrella on one frequency band and then small cells sitting underneath them providing even more capacity at a different frequency band. But for the frequency that we have with, uh, with for example, FirstNet, we've got one frequency. So you have to be very careful managing macro cells and small cells to avoid interfering with each other. As we go farther out in the rural area, we start getting into these more boomer sites, which I think are more typical like LMR sites. They're up on high places. They cover a very wide area, you know, 10 to 25 miles. They could cover 50 miles. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, the LMR plots here in Utah, 